Okay, so I thought those two videos did a very good job of summing up the facts and the findings of of both um, Bakke and Greta V. Bollinger. And what it really comes down to is people who are not um, getting admitted into the schools find it problematic that others are getting into the school that are perhaps um, have lower scores than them. So they wanted the court to address how that's equal, how people are being treated as equal. And in Bakke, they really didn't address affirmative action. They kind of, kind of passed the buck and instead they just said that the quota was wrong. And then in Grutter v. Bollinger, they said that the admission policy was fine because when they looked at it, they were, they were taking race and other things into account when making those decisions. And really that's all there is to it. Um, as far as memorization goes, you're not going to have to remember the facts of either of those cases, but it is helpful to know the facts when you're thinking about affirmative action and how it works out. So we'll look at some problems before the, or during the review regarding affirmative action. And the only other thing, uh, Fisher involved an undergraduate student. So all of these cases involved um, schools and people who were denied admission to those schools um, filing a filing suit and then contesting it and appealing that decision all the way to the Supreme Court. And each of these were heard. The exception was number two, Adiran versus Pena, and that involved the Department of Transportation. So it was an organization receiving federal funding or contracts. So we will move on from there on to this next slide regarding the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So it's important to note that the impetus behind the Civil Rights Act of 64 was the black civil rights movement. And so you had boycotts being led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. One of those was the bus boycott. And so if you click on the Democracy Now! clip underneath uh, the heading, Always Fight With Love, you will see, I believe it's uh, two minutes and 37 seconds, something, something uh, fairly short that will actually show you some footage of that boycott. So uh, I would encourage you to look at it if you, if you would like. And then to your right, you see a question that was asked on a previous test and it said the modern civil rights movement had its peak movement moment, I'm sorry, with the March on Washington in 1963. And then you see um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. surrounded by all of the people in front of Washington Monument. So 1963 was an important year and we know what happened after 1963. You have the 1964 Civil Rights Act that was passed. So were these boycotts and were these marches effective? Absolutely. So when we think about the Civil Rights Act, we know that it wasn't um, well received by everyone. Certainly it got the attention of the government and the government got behind it. However, the general public didn't necessarily agree with it. And even to this day, the general public doesn't really like to get involved with protests. Although, you know, this may be changing as we see with some of these protests after uh, the Minneapolis um, police officer killing um, George Floyd. So, you know, maybe Americans are starting to see the power of these protests again, like they did in the 60s. But as far as the Civil Rights Act is concerned, it was signed into law by LBJ um, after JFK's assassination. I think JFK had been working on it um, with Dr. Martin Luther King, but then it was later signed into law by LBJ. And the Equal Protection Clause gave the 14th Amendment more influence, prohibiting segregation in restaurants, hotels, and theaters, public recreation areas, schools, and libraries. 
So it was aimed at eliminating discriminatory treatment by private individuals in their employment practices and their public accommodation operations. It guaranteed equal voting rights. It also created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, otherwise known as the EEOC. And with that, you had agency employees or government agency employees gaining the right to sue their employer, also part of their government, if they believed that they were guilty of committing a discriminatory act against them. So they would file suit and then they would have the equal, they would go before the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission um, and they would make a determination as to whether or not discrimination had occurred. And finally, it gave the government, the federal government, the right to withhold funds from states that resisted the law. We also want to make note that um, even though we've had all of these movements with the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 and the Housing Rights Act of 68, we still have an unequal society as far as black Americans are concerned. And it remains elusive. And we have to, at some point, um, quit putting it on the back burner and address it as a nation. Because I believe it's kind of like the founding fathers with our compromises. They want to put them off, but if you keep putting something off, it's going to lead to the inevitable problem that later comes about. So they kept putting off slavery and they kept um, making compromises as far as slavery was concerned. And what ended up happening was the Civil War resulted. So when you see unequal treatment and it continues to be a pervasive problem within society, you have to address it at some point. The government specifically, if they need to have some sort of fact-finding commission, um, then they need to do that. But you can't just continue to ignore an issue that's becoming um, increasingly problematic and disadvantaging certain individuals more than others. Now, we'll say that there's been substantial progress in elective office. I think they have about 400 black mayors who have been elected into office. There's around 40 black members of Congress. And then we had uh, the 44th president of the United States was an African American who served two terms um, as president. And you've had two, two African American Supreme Court justices, first being Thurgood Marshall and then Clarence Thomas also. So hopefully um, you will continue to see progress I like to think that there will be progress for these individuals, and I certainly believe in fair treatment for everyone. And I think that these protests are encouraging and hopefully encouraging for those of other races to see that, you know, individuals who are outside of their race also support their cause as well. Okay, our third objective is to demonstrate knowledge of the civil rights movement for women. So, as the abolitionist movement against slavery progressed, women were fighting along with that cause. And so, women who especially wanted the right to vote would, would protest along with the abolitionists. Well, after the 15th Amendment was ratified, at that point, the abolitionist movement didn't move forward along with the women. So the women kind of went at it alone. So they had protests and there's some great, some great documentaries out there regarding a lot of the women who participated, what they did in order to be heard. Um, and it involved some, some notable men too that were involved in their cause. But it wasn't until the night well, until 1920, that the 19th Amendment was ratified. Um, so it took from 1848 to 1920 to get the right to vote. So you see, that was a long, hard-fought battle. Then they had the Equal Rights Amendment introduced in 1923, and it was approved 50 years later, but failed state ratification. 
as far as the Equal Rights Amendment was concerned, um, while it failed ratification, it failed ratification by a small amount of states. So were we to move forward today, there's the potential for it to be passed. In fact, last semester, I want to say that I read an article saying that there were enough states to ratify it at this point. But once I heard that, I started looking into it and I saw that some of the states were going back on their word and saying that, you know, that was a long time ago, we need to revisit the subject. And also, they would also say that um, it was beyond the statute of limitations as presented to them originally with that equal um, rights amendment. So just keep that on your radar, something to look at. It, it would mean that women would be paid equally. Um, right now, I believe women make 82 cents on the dollar as far as their pay rate with men, unfortunately. Um, I do want to note this bottom section. Um, it shows a former test question. It says the movement for women's rights was initially aligned with the abolitionist movement. So um, this came from a magazine article and it says women's rights emerges within the abolition movement. So it basically came out of the abolitionist movement and then continued on even after um, the 15th Amendment had been granted. All right, so this says that women have not achieved job equality. They earn less than men. Um, women's groups continue to press for comparable work policies that would give them and men equal hourly pay for jobs that require similar training and education. Unfortunately, um, most single parent families are headed by women and about one in three of those families live below the poverty line. And the author makes note of that and it says that that is known as the feminization of poverty. So if you look at this bar graph taken from the U.S. Census Bureau in 2016, you're looking at the percentage of families living in poverty by family composition so that's saying that 6% of your two parent families are living in poverty. 16% of those with a male headed family are living in poverty. And then 32% of female headed families are living in poverty, which is very unfortunate. It's double that of the male headed families. And with women earning, um, slightly lower amounts than men, it's understandable as well. So the question that was asked previously is which type of household has the lowest percentage of families living in poverty? And so you're looking for the lowest percentage and that would be the two-parent family. So it, it also notes that poverty is five times higher among female-headed households than among two-parent households. So like African Americans, there have been sub substantial gains in appointed and elective offices. Um, the first woman to serve on the Supreme Court was Sandra Day O'Connor, and that is this woman down at the bottom, pictured at the bottom. And she was appointed in 1981 by President Reagan. Um, there have been several women that have been appointed since, but she is known as the first. Um, the first woman on the national ticket of a major political party was Geraldine Ferraro um, as the Democratic Party's vice presidential nominee in 1984, which was an unsuccessful race um, for both she and Michael Dukakis. And then the first woman to head a major party's national ticket was Hillary Clinton in 2016. And it says that women hold less than one in four congressional seats. And the two questions that were asked at the bottom of this slide, the first woman to ever serve on the U.S. Supreme Court was appointed by who? And that was President Ronald Reagan. So you need to somehow make the association of Sandra Day O'Connor to President Ronald Reagan because 
the question could be asked, um, who appointed her or who did Ronald Reagan appoint? So you, you get the idea if that question is asked, that's how they would go about asking it. And then it says how many states ratified the Equal Rights Amendment, and it says nearly three-fourths. So nearly three-fourths was not quite enough to have it ratified. Now, today, we would have enough, but you have states going back and then states saying, arguing, you know, there's a statute of limitations that they need to look at. So as far as the United States in comparison with other national legislatures, we are actually fairly low. Um, Sweden comes in highest at 44% of the women holding holding seats in the legislative office. Netherlands comes in, or the Netherlands comes in at second at 36%. Great Britain comes in at third with 32%. Germany, Canada, and then the United States with 19%, and then Japan is last with 10%. So um, I would think that we could move up this ladder. And given the 2018 midterm election results, I would think that we see we see some progress in that area. So it's going to change based on population and who is voting and turning out to vote. So that's always important. So it says, based on the seats in the single or lower legislative chamber, which is the House of Representatives in the case of the United States, the U.S. ranks substantially below European democracies in terms of the percentage of women lawmakers. So we've got a ways to go as far as um, receiving equal treatment to that of our male counterparts, but I think, like to think that we will get there. Our fourth learning objective is to identify civil rights battles being fought by minority groups. So one of those groups is Hispanic Americans. So you need to know that Hispanic Americans are one of our oldest ethnic groups in the nation. They colonized Florida, New Mexico, California, and Arizona. They are also the fastest growing minority and the lar largest minority group. With that being said, in Texas, the predictions show that in 2020, after the census is taken, the Hispanic population will exceed that of the Anglo population for the first time. And then they've made projections through the decades up to 2050, and it's just going on an upward scale. So you have recent civil rights action that has been centered on undocumented Im immigrants. Um, if you will notice uh, different stories involving ICE, maybe uh, taking advantage of certain individuals and not getting warrants and gaining access to these individuals, which becomes a civil rights issue. And the ACLU gets involved and brings cases um, to the Supreme Court or whomever it can, you know, to get that action reversed. So there have been civil rights actions based on um, this current administration. And you'll note that even in earlier elections, earlier than the 2016 presidential election, you, you could have heightened legislative or law enforcement efforts um, as a result of some of the campaigns and the campaigns are wanting to point point you know how the United States could become stronger if in fact it didn't um, have so many illegal immigrants taking advantage although that is that is definitely for another class and someone else to make that argument I will say that they make that argument I don't know that I find that argument to be convincing but you know people certainly have presented that argument. So here is Hector Garcia. He was uh, the founder for the American GI Forum. Here he is with Lyndon B. Johnson. They were good friends. Um, he was a Mexican-American doctor who served in World War II. And so after he returned home, he dedicated his life to helping Hispanic veterans receive the benefits that they deserved. Another example of Hector Garcia extending 
his helping hand to the um, Hispanic Americans was with the Felix Longoria um, funeral. So Felix Longoria was a combat veteran in World War II. He was killed in action and he was a decorated soldier. So he was brought to the Three Rivers Funeral Home in South Texas and upon arrival he was not going to be allowed awake in the funeral home and then they also stated that he would not be able to be buried with the whites in the cemetery. They said perhaps he could get a barbed, some barbed wire put around a section um, so that he wasn't, he wasn't included with the whites. So at that point, Hector Garcia got involved. He called Lyndon B. Johnson. Lyndon B. Johnson then um, made sure that Felix Longoria got a proper funeral. In fact, they took the body to Arlington National Cemetery and they held service there. So that was an interesting um, situation. I had no idea that um, the Hispanic community was treated you know, so unfairly, even its soldiers. So, there were a few um, important Supreme Court cases involving Mexican-American schools. Um, one of these served as a precedent for Brown versus Board of Education. I won't get into that case. You're not required to know it, but I did want to make a note that there is this movie out called A Stolen Education that emphasizes some of the struggles that the Hispanic Americans went through. And you unfortunately had segregated uh, schools for the Hispanic Americans and then they would also keep them, hold them back a number of years. And so what, what essentially was happening was they were staying in the same grade for two or three terms. And so they weren't graduating at the same rate that their white counterparts were. And so a lot of people got upset about that. And so the film addresses how they were treated during that time period. And it's really, um, you know, eye-opening. And you, it, I, I thought it was very well done. So if you get a chance and you would like to see that, um, it's it's available, I believe, on Netflix, maybe Amazon, um, one of the two. This next slide looks at Hernandez versus Texas and whether or not Latinos were tried by their peers. So this is attorney Gus Garcia, who appears before the Supreme Court, and he's making the argument that, you know, there's disparate treatment on the part of Texas where it comes to Mexican Americans. And the state of Texas comes back and says, well, he was tried by his peers. Though they, yes, they were all white, but he's white too. We don't consider um, Hispanics to be anything other than white. And so he presented evidence suggesting otherwise, and the court found in favor of Mr. Hernandez. But it helped, I guess, um, it said, if you read over here in the site, it said it was established by the fact there was a distinction between white and Mexican ancestries individuals because in the Jackson County Courthouse, there were two men's toilets, one unmarked and the other marked colored men and hombres aquí, or men here. It also was evidenced by the fact that there was no Mexican ancestry person who had served on the jury in 25 years. So they found that Mexican Americans were a special class entitled to equal protection under the law. So this next slide speaks to the boycotts that they discovered worked so well for them. As far as um, the Hispanic laborers were concerned, they received better working conditions and wages. This is Cesar Chavez and the boycotts that he led were primarily in California. Other states also tried to boycott, but they were, weren't as successful as the boycotts that were led in California by Mr. Chavez. The next slide looks at where you have 
the lowest percentage of Hispanic population, and that's going to be your northern areas. So obviously, you're going to have a higher population as far as minorities, especially Hispanic, the Hispanic population, where we share a border with um, Mexico. So this slide evidences the struggle for equality, and it's a continuing struggle for equality for this Hispanic Americans. So they note that Hispanics' income is substantially below national average, but the effect is somewhat buffered by the fact that the family is integral to the Hispanic culture. So they work together as a unit, and so that can offset some of the lower paying jobs that are held. And they, they work together to help each other to get ahead. It says more than 4,000 Hispanic Americans hold public office. Um, they hold office in Congress, on the Supreme Court. They're involved in presidential politics. And it says about half of all Hispanic Americans are registered to vote. So there is the potential for more registration and the potential for them to affect um, the vote even more than is already the, is already the case. And it says there's political they are a political force in states like Texas, California, and Florida. So this question reads, Hispanic Americans are all of these except what? And they are the fastest growing majority in the U.S. They have made major political gains in terms of le elected local offices. They are one of the nation's, nation's oldest ethnic groups. And then it says their average annual income is relatively close to national average. And we noted that it's substantially below national average. So just note um, relatively close and, and substantially below are not the same thing. So the wording of these questions sometimes can be problematic. So just be careful about the way you read something on a test. And you'll say, well, doesn't um, relatively close mean the same thing as substantially below? And no, they don't mean the same thing. And they, they're not even close. But you may have remembered them saying something like that, but you don't want to choose that as your answer because it's incorrect. The next group we want to talk about are Native Americans. So with the Native American population, um, it started decreasing from 5 to 10 million when the white settlers first arrived to a less than a million by 1900. Um, they weren't granted citizenship until 1924, despite um, the 13th Amendment ratification in 1865. Um, you had an Indian Bill of Rights passed in, eight, in 1968, which provided for the constitutional guarantees of Amer Native Americans on reservations. I actually have a slide that will take you through um, the land acquisition um, of the Native Americans. And you can see how they once had a great deal of land and how over the years it was essentially um, taken and taken and taken to, to the effect that they, they don't hold very much property at all. Okay, so it's important to note that, like the other groups, protests for Native Americans also led to greater control over their own affairs. So you had the Hispanics um, protesting with their boycotts and getting um, better working conditions and wages. You had, you know, women protesting in um, New York with Seneca Falls and getting the the right to vote eventually, and then you had African Americans also protesting and gaining um, rights through the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and the Housing Rights Act. So you're seeing that protests are in fact effective, and that was true of Na Native Americans as well with this 1972 uh, Trail of Broken Treaties protest. They were initially going to negotiate, um, I believe with Richard Nixon, and then he, it was a week before um, the election, and he had decided that he didn't want to become involved. And so they became upset, 
and they had more or less a sit-in and it eventually turned somewhat violent and they burned some papers and burned a few offices and afterwards um, some concessions were made on the part of Richard Nixon um, the, so the 1973 Wounded Knee Standoff was a year after the Trail of Broken Treaties it was a little bit longer than the week-long um, occupancy at the Capitol I want to say it was around 70, 70 days or so. And unfortunately, it didn't end up with as many concessions as the first one did. But it gained the attention of the media and the American public. And the American public began to sympathize with um, some of the injustices that they had seen um, against the Native Americans. So you had that result um, from the Wounded Knee standoff. So, so what you're looking at here is the Newsweek cover after the 2018 midterms and it states there's a historic first. This is Deb Hagland. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but she is a Native American from Kansas, who is one of the first, who was one of the first um, Native American females who was elected to Congress. And you had another uh, Native American female who was also elected, but she was from Kansas. And so both of them took office and swore, and and were sworn in, and they hugged each other afterwards and recognized the significance of their swearing in. I believe one of them. Um, wore their ceremonial, um, native, native ceremonial um, attire to, to the swearing-in ceremony. So I thought that that was um, nice as well. So I think that's great when you have different cultures being represented. And so I'm very happy that they now have a voice in Congress and hopefully we'll continue to have that voice. So the struggle for equality for Native Americans will continue. Currently, you have around 2 million full-blooded Native Americans, including Alaska Natives, living um, on federal reservations. Well, around half of them live on federal reservations. Federal authority is generally defined by treaty terms. Your state governments have no direct authority over them. So current policy go goals of the federal government include retention of the Native cultures, and self-government and economic self-sufficiency. But um, there is currently tribal state conflicts that will persist over casino gaming. And if you, if you travel to the West, uh, New Mexico is going to allow for casino gaming. Um, if you travel North, Oklahoma allows for it. If you travel um, Northeast, Arkansas allows for it, and then Louisiana, if you travel directly east, um, Louisiana allows for it as well. So Texas, unfortunately, is losing revenue to those four states because Texas doesn't allow gaming in the state of Texas. Um, so if it wants to revisit the subject, that's something it certainly can do. If it wants to determine whether or not uh, gaming would be in its best interest. Given the conservative nature of Texas, I'm doubtful of that happening anytime soon, but you never know. Um, this is the, the original land held by the, the different tribes. And so um, I, don't have, I don't have it up right now, but I do have it available. So you can see over the decades how the land starts disappearing from the tribes. But, Initially, this was the land claimed by, um, by each tribe. All right. Now we want to look at Asian Americans. So Chinese and Japanese laborers were brought to the western states as laborers in mines and railroads in the late 1800s. And then in 1892, Congress suspended Asian immigration. Um, and they said that the Chinese were an inferior people. 
So you had immigration restrictions that were finally ended in 1965. Um, the Supreme Court case of Lau versus Nichols in 1974 prompted the beginning of bilingual instruction in some schools. And it says um, Asian Americans now number around 12 million out of roughly 330 million. And most live on the West Coast, particularly California. So Asians are considered an upward, upwardly mobile group. Most Asians, Asian cultures emphasize family-based self-reliance with an emphasis on education. They have the highest percentage of two-parent families of any racial group. And then they also have the highest median family income. So they're educated and driven, yet underrepresented politically and in managerial jobs. So while they do have certain things going for them, they're still politically dis disadvantaged and don't hold managerial jobs. So maybe that's something that they can work towards in the future. Okay, next we want to look at the case of Korematsu versus the United States in 1944. And the question is, the Supreme Court addresses is, does a military order excluding certain races of Americans from designated areas of the United States violate the Equal Protection Clause? So this is dealing with, um, this is dealing with the internment camps that the Japanese were forced into um, during World War II. So let's take a look at Korematsu versus the United States and find what the Supreme Court holds as far as this military order excluding these races um, and whether or not that's in violation of the Equal Protection Clause.
enjoyed the Cora Matsu um, video. I certainly enjoy these, but it, if you don't, just let me know and I can just include them as links. But I like to include them um, just for future reference and for future classes, just in the event that they want to see them. And I think they're helpful for you as well because they're very um, uh, succinct at telling you the fact pattern, what was going on, and, and how it was resolved. You know, Korematsu is still regarded as a terrible decision by the Supreme Court, um, but again, it's like the Patriot Act. When you're during times of war, don't expect your country to act act like it would normally act. So maybe you have situations um, such as internment camps uh, brought about. Ideally, that would not be the case. Um, but as you can see, it certainly was in 1944. All right. Figure 5.2 looks at the changing face of immigration. What it wants you to note here is in the 60s and 70s, you primarily had people or immigrants coming from Europe and Canada, as opposed to in the 90s and 2000s, you had more coming from Asia and Latin America. So just notice the differences there and the dates. So it says until 1965, immigration laws were biased in favor of European immigrants. The laws enacted in 1965 increased the proportion of immigrants from Asia and Latin America. Percentages are totals for a decade. For example, 2010 figures are from 2001 to 2010 period. Okay. With learning objective 5.5, we want to evaluate the significance of demographic changes in the United States. It appears to be missing a U, so I'll just go ahead and fix that. It needs to be capitalized. And I'm having issues right now. Okay, corrected. Now, as far as minority groups, um, it says minorities as a percentage of state population. So your southern states obviously are going to have a higher, higher concentration of minorities um, in their state population. And then increasingly it becomes lower as you go north. But when you combine the percentages, black Americans, Hispanics, and Asian Americans will constitute about 40% of the population. And well, that's at present. And by 2050, it will constitute a majority. So you are looking at demographic changes in the United States. And we've always been a melting pot. And perhaps I think um, more so than most countries. So when we look at some of the tensions that we have, uh, we are really a different situation than, you know, a lot of the countries that we're being compared with. So. Now we want to look at other disadvantaged groups because in 1964, the Civil Rights Act only classified women and minorities as legally protected groups. So there were other um, disadvantaged groups that didn't have protections in that legislation. And included in those are older Americans who gained protections through the Age Discrimination and, and Employment Act of 1967 and through the Age Discrimination Act or ADA in 1975. You also had Americans with disabilities who gained protections from the Education for All Handicapped Children Act of 1975, and then the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, of 1990. So I wanted to speak to the older Americans, especially because it's been a point of contention here recently with um, the state of Texas. And the state of Texas is, I guess, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick made mention of the fact that the elderly should be willing to risk their lives for the economy. And you didn't only hear it from him. After he said it, you started hearing it from a lot of people, Republican and Democrat, um, regardless of party affiliation because they want the economy to remain stable and so the older Americans should just sacrifice themselves I guess and so I thought that that was a little bit insulting and 
And if I were an elderly American, I would have probably called Mr. Patrick up and had a few words with him, or at least left some on his machine so that I felt better. But no, you don't put your grandma and grandpa in harm's way to boost the economy. If you can't figure out a way around that, then um, you need to get back to the drawing board because um, as far as I'm concerned, those people have earned their right to be here and you, you really do want to protect them at all cost. They're, they're, maybe they don't seem valuable as far as economic purposes go and maybe it would suit you not to have to um, deal with them but as far as the public goes and your citizens go we do appreciate our elderly so I think stay off stay away from our elderly everyone alright so other disadvantaged groups also include the LGBTQ community it was formerly barred from military service and had no employment protections or rights. These prohibitions no longer exist, although there was some question there for a little bit. Um, but um, they have greater legal protections in some jurisdictions for the, ju for the transgender. The U.S. has seen a rapid swing in public opinion towards the acceptance of same-sex marriage in the last two decades particularly among younger adults. And there's a graph in your book that shows that back in the 90s, it was not as acceptable and it's just skyrocketed since then. Um, Massachusetts was the first state to permit same-sex marriage in 2004. So Massachusetts would welcome others to become married. And so gradually other states started doing it as well. And finally, um, you had the Supreme Court address the issue in Obergefell v. Hodges in 2015 and expanded that right as a precedent to all Americans. So with that precedent or ruling, all Americans in all states had to allow for same-sex marriage. And that was in 2015. But even before then, um, before the Obergefell decision, you had Lawrence v. Texas finding in favor of uh, homosexuals stating that the 14th Amendment and the liberty protected by the Constitutional allows homosexual persons the right to make their choice um, as to how they want to go about conducting their lives. And it reversed a 1986 decision of uh, about... Okay, so... You may be more familiar with this 2018 decision involving Masterpiece Cake Shop versus the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. Um, the Colorado Civil Rights Commission had found in favor of a gay couple who had asked that Masterpiece Cake Shop um, honor their wish for um, a wedding cake to be designed for their um, their gay their gay marriage, and so. Masterpiece Cake Shop sued the Civil Rights Commission and they said that that was an infringement of their First Amendment um, freedom of speech and exercise as far as religion is concerned, their beliefs, and that they have the right to deny that. And the Supreme Court um, did find in Masterpiece Cake Shop's favor and they said by failing to act in a manner neutral to religion, the Colorado Civil Rights Commission violated the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So um, it's really how they go about wording some of these Supreme Court cases as to how much you'll get out of them. And I think they, they kind of um, dealt more with freedom of speech than they did with other rights there. So it, had it been worded differently, they might have, um, they might have, come out with a different outcome, but because they narrowly put it in that narrow frame, that's why they reached the decision that they reached. This is the graph that I was speaking about earlier. It's 5-3 opinions on same-sex marriage. So in 97, you had maybe 27% of those approving of same-sex marriage, and today 
you can see the majority of people support it, um, ranking over 60% or 65%. And that was 2017, so I can only assume that there's an upward trajectory there. So the next slide looks at discrimination. So it says there are superficial differences, but deep divisions. That America's high idealists often clash with its reality, and it's still necessary to combat America's curse or race discrimination, um, unfortunately. And a test question that was asked um, was, according to Swedish sociologist Gunnar Mirandal, and I'm I'm guessing on that last name because I've never heard it pronounced. Um, America's curse is racial discrimination. And so that was around World War II that he made that proclamation and it still rings true to this day. So we still haven't um, gotten away from that label. Ameri Abraham Lincoln stated that the United States is a nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. So it's something that we look to achieve, and I'm hopeful that we will achieve. But when you look at reality, you often see that that, that is more of a dream than anything at the moment. So I would like for you to watch this. I'm not going to require it on the film or on video, but this is where my dad went to high school. So he went to high school in Jonesville, Louisiana, and I grew up there up until maybe third grade we moved because my mom got a teaching job outside of um, that area. And so we moved and I was very sad because my grandparents lived on a working farm and I got to name all the animals and I got any animal I wanted. And, um, anyway, I had a lot of fun living on the farm. So then I had to go to a school, and it was a private school, so I wasn't thrilled with that. Um, and I wasn't thrilled with leaving all of my friends. But regardless, we look back today, and the school that my dad went to is now in ruins. But And it's almost 67% African American, and they have teachers who are teaching subjects that they're not qualified to teach. Um, they have, unfortunately, mold and mildew all over their books. It's just a really sad situation. But if you go up around 13 miles up north, you'll see that Harrisonburg um, High School is much nicer. And the percentage of whites um, is much greater. So, um, and it looks... It's a, it's a far nicer school, but when confronted, I guess one of the persons who would be responsible for the situation noted that, well, Harrisonburg had passed a bond, and so that's how they're able to um, afford some of the luxuries that they're, they're afforded. So in the upcoming slides, I told you that I would include some of the civil rights um, movies that you could you could watch. So Harriet would, and they ranked them. Um, I believe some of the top, maybe the top ten civil rights movies that they recommend. And I think this was The Hill. Yeah, The Hill. Um, Harriet, which was a very recent movie. Selma, another fairly recent movie. The Visitor trailer. I have not seen this one, so I'm not certain. Um, how good it is. I do like this actor, so um, it might be good. Again, I love this movie. I've seen it three times. I never saw Get Out, but it does deal with civil rights issues, so um, maybe I do need to see it, but I'm kind of one of those people who gets spooked out real easy, and so um, I try to keep my imagination um, away uh, so that I'm not thinking that they're ghosts and and other things that I don't want around me so anyway I'm just I'm just I've just always been like that and it's 
it's kind of embarrassing, but at the same time, it's true. I just don't like uh, scary movies. In fact, I flipped uh, Lazy Boy on top of myself in eighth grade watching uh, Children of the Corn or something like that at a friend's house, and her parents had to come rescue me. So, yeah, I, I don't like to watch scary movies. The next one is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, The Butler, The Other Side of Immigration. I have not seen this, but I will see it. And then I think the last one is regarding the LGBT movement, and this is Milk. Um, and I think I've seen a part part of it. I did not get to finish it. So um, anyway, I hope that you get to enjoy these, and I hope you enjoyed this lecture on equal rights. And I just wanted to say that, you know, I did my best to present all of the information that the text provides you in a way that you would understand it because some of the Supreme Court cases were very complex and I didn't, I hadn't heard about them in college. So when I went to law school, they were news to me. So I don't want to ever put you guys in a situation like that. And I feel like giving you more information is better than not giving it to you at all. So I hope that you gained a lot of information from this because chapter five is one of the longest chapters and most important chapters that we're going to cover this semester. So that's why I try to get all of the points in as far as this chapter is concerned. See you guys in a little bit with chapter six.